you, there were several years that went by after I left Nashville that um, I didn't get in contact with folks and didn't kind of stay in contact. And I remember reaching out to you here several years ago, and I thought, you know, he's not going to remember. I'll have to jog his memory, you know, and, and uh, it was I was just shocked when you came right back and, and was like, yeah, hey, what's going on? You know, and, and that uh, that kinship among songwriters is something that I've always treasured, you know, and you, writing a song with somebody has always been like, well, you're, you're sharing your innermost emotions in, uh, a lot of the time when you're really digging into some of these emotional songs and um, getting into how folks think. Um, you know, everyone has a different way that they like to think about songwriting. Um, mine is there's a layer of songs right over the top of my head and usually some one of them will hang a leg down and and uh, I'll grab it and I'll get to be the writer of that song that's kind of that imaginary thing that I think of so I was wondering what is your philosophy about how songs come to be or uh, be a conduit for them or um, how do you think about it wow uh well in Nashville when I got to Nashville of course it's all about co-writing yeah and when you co-write it's a whole different deal because you obviously you like in your case, you had the idea and I was able to build on it, which of course is a lot of fun. Cause then you don't have the terror of the blank page. You, you'd already taken care of that. I didn't have to worry about that. So the way it works in Nashville is, you know, you have your 10 AM appointment and you just start running ideas off each other. And depending on who has the most, credibility like if i was writing with a top writer they'd sit there and they'd say what do you got kid yeah i guess right. if i was the top writer they would say what do you got kid yeah i don't know but um you know that that's that's one way to write and the thing about that kind of writing is because you were writing for uh you don't know who's going to record it you have to keep your ideas somewhat general yeah. because you know, maybe one artist that you really like would never do a song about cheating, but maybe the other artist would happily do a song about cheating, but don't mention drinking, you know? Yeah. So you kind of co-writing, you end up shaving a lot of rough edges off. Now, when you write by yourself, you can do anything, you know, whatever your personal experiences are. And I think those are the better songs, but those are harder to get into the public if you're not the artist. That's true. So since I'm not an artist, I'm not a singer, it's sort of, you know, when I'm really trying to make a living at it, you have to go for that more general approach and yet still be fresh enough that it moves the the discussion along as far as songwriting, you know, as, as, yeah. as far as the psyche of the country, because you're writing the songs that they're going to hear a year or two later and you want to have some kind of originality in it, but you are hemmed in by a lot of, commercial uh, considerations. I agree Christmas songs, on the other hand, you already know going in what you're writing about. So it's really fun because like, how can I write about Christmas that isn't just like snowflakes and, and you know, ornaments on the tree. It's been done a million times. Right. So it's fun to look at like, what would be the song you would write about the season? What would be the song you'd write about Christmas Eve? What's a Christmas day song? What's a new character, like what we had? And I really enjoy writing Christmas songs because each one's sort of like trying to write a new movie about right. about the same event, different yeah. angle. You know? Yeah, that that's so true. You know, the Christmas is such a the ideas. You know, you stop and think about it. There, you can kind of be limited. You know, you're right. You know, what what do you write that's not about, like you said, snowflakes and Christmas trees and this? What else can you add? I just think you nailed it uh, with some of the music you've written over the years, man. Uh, uh, just Thank you. astounding, astounding stuff. But um, I was curious, too. Um, in, what was it, 74, I think it was, you ended up playing for, like, Rod Stewart, um, you were doing keyboards and stuff a lot of for a lot of big artists at the time, right? Um, well, that, that story, uh, you know, like a lot of things in the music business, you you have to be ready if you have a break 
you never know if a break's going to come. But that break was I had, uh, had a friend that wanted me to play on his demo. He couldn't pay me anything. The only thing he could do, he says, I have a friend that has a head shop, and uh, he'll give you a bong if you'll play on it. And I didn't really smoke pot, but I had friends that did. And I said, if I do this session, you guys want a bong? And they were like, yeah, do it. So I went and I played on the session, and it wasn't a very good song. But in walks Steve Cropper, who I guess co-owned the studio. And he's just sort of looking around. And I'm not a guitar player, but I know who Steve Cropper is. And I knew what my friends would want to know. And I just started going, you know, you, this kind of thing. And I said, my friend wants to know about your pickups. And I didn't even know what a pickup is. But so he started explaining me his pickups and everything. He stuck around. He thought I was good. And he took my phone number. And I went, wow, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Well, I'm living at my parents' house at this point. And they get a phone call, and my mom says, it's, it's somebody named Steve Cropper. And so I, I get on the phone, and he goes, will you come down and do a session for me tonight? And I went, okay. And uh, uh, he says, for Rod Stewart. And the reason it was for Rod Stewart was because David Foster was the piano player, and he'd gone home for Christmas to Canada, and he didn't have his papers in order, and they held him at the border. So they needed a piano player. And they went, Nicky Hopkins couldn't do it. They went through like four piano players and Steve Cropper said, well, I know this kid, if you want to take a chance. And Rod Stewart said, well, if you think so. So I came in and the song we did was called Ball Trap. She's got me in a ball trap. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I just, it's like, okay, I know how to do this. You know, just, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, then he said, I'm leaving the faces and I'm starting a band. Will you be in my band? And wow. so I went from, my mom answering the phone, borrowing her car to joining the, the first Rod Stewart band when he left the Faces in like three hours time. And That's uh, incredible. Yeah. And so I was in his band. For, I was in the Faceless. You know, you have Rod Stewart and the face, Faces. So I was in Rod Stewart and the Faceless. And now it's Rod Stewart and the Facelifts. So that's, <laughs> that's my story. But yeah, I was in it for three years. You know, did all those crazy things that you would imagine, you know, yeah. at 19, 20 years old. So. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 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 Off the hook and, and living life and, and rolling through the world. Oh, my gosh, man. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um.